You're listening to Radio Free Satan. Enjoy the show. I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Yes, it is another week, another episode of Nine Cents. Welcome. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world. And I, as every week, am your host, Adam Campbell. It is great to have you. It's April 22nd, and I've got a great show for you this week. And actually, before I get into it, as usual again, I wanted to talk about an episode coming up next week. And this is something that I cannot believe I forgot to mention last week. I was uh, I actually listened to all my podcasts Um, partially because I'm incredibly vain, and also so I can learn from any potential mistakes, or let's just say mistakes that I've made, because they're not a potential if you do them often. I'm trying to continually evolve in a more professional and uh, entertaining manner as a podcaster, so listening to my own shows helps me. But back to the point, Valpurgis Noct is coming up, everyone. That's right. Valpurgisnacht, the the holiday that the Church of Satan was founded upon. And this is year 47, Anno Satanus. And this Valpurgisnacht week, I've got a special guest. And if you're connected with me in any way, you already know this. But for those of you who aren't, pull up a seat. <clears throat> I got a secret. I sat down with the High Priest of the Church of Satan... Magus Peter H. Gilmore, and we talked very personally and candidly about himself, about the Church of Satan, about Anton LaVey, and a very exciting announcement, and that'll be next week. So, yes, you're welcome. This is something that I've been alluding to all year about exciting things in the works, and this is it, and it's finally here. One more week to go. I cannot wait. Uh, Great, great stuff. Magus Gilmore is an amazing human being. I mean, really easy to talk to. I don't know that anyone would expect differently, but when often when I think of someone that I respect, uh, whom I've never met, because of their accomplishment, um, for what they stand for, well, I get a little excited. And this this is uh, worth the excitement. So, Valpurgis Noct episode... 47, Anno Satanus, High Priest, Magus, Peter H. Gilmore, all about the stuff that you've never heard about. And that's the best part of this entire thing, is that it's not uh, me sitting down with Magus Gilmore and talking about Satanism. We all already know that. I mean, this is something I do every single week on the show, though to no... (laughs) No degree like he does, so let me put it out there. You know, I'm, I'm not claiming to be on, on par with uh, <laughs> the high priest by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but you've heard interviews of him speaking to that a, a thousand times, and they're everywhere. This, hmm, this is not that. And that is why I was so excited to be able, that he agreed, one, to talk with me about uh, some, you know, pretty personal stuff. Uh, but also just to bring it to you. I, I mean, I, I feel like this is a big deal, you know? And I think you do too. So tune in. You won't regret it. Also, today is Earth Day. Yay, Earth Day. Like, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. I remember when, at least when I was a kid and I had first heard about Earth Day, uh, I was in, I think I was in middle school. I don't know. But it was this big thing about everyone, oh, you know, the earth, everyone love the earth and hug the earth and hug a tree and do everything you can, recycle and don't pollute, give a hoot, you know, it's this idea of, of giving up, I don't know, your commercial existence and planting a tree, you know, just spending the day in, what, retrospect for what the earth has done for you and really, what has the earth done for you except for try to shake us off its back? Like fleas. I mean, realistically. (laughs) All those natural disasters, that's the earth. It's not a god. It's the earth. (laughs) A disease, arguably, 
can also come from said earth. Everything we do, we like to pretend like, oh, we want to save the earth and save the planet, when really, no, we don't care about that. What we want to do is make sure it's still habitable for us, <laughs> for us to continue destroying and polluting. It has nothing to do with the earth at all, because believe me, the rock, the molten core of the earth, doesn't care about us. So, yes, it is. I, for some hippies out there, it's great to have an Earth Day. For me... I like to think of it as more of an indulgence day. I mean, I am a Satanist, so every day's, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, is an indulgence day. But uh, this day in particular, because it reminds me that because our lives are so incredibly short, and our span of species existing on the Earth is so incredibly sm short, and just small and tiny, and um, it makes our lives that we're living so incredibly important that we have to focus and we have to indulge. I mean, let's face it. The sole reason why human existence is so short is the very reason... Uh, not, okay, let me, let me correct that. It's not the sole reason here. And it, certainly it's probably not a reason at all. I'm just trying to get to my point of Satanism is uh, celebrating the human condition. And that human condition is indulgence. It's the watchword of Satanism. It's, it's recognizing that we have such a short time and to live every day to the fullest. And so in honor of that, in The Devil's Advocate, I'm going to be bringing you an article from the Satanic Bible. I think you know who that's by, right? Yeah. <laughs> Called Indulgence, Not Compulsion. I'm going to talk about the article. I'm not going to read the article, but I'll, I'll give you sort of my rundown and the gist of it as I see it and, you know, how it sort of relates to everything else that I've ever talked about. And in Furl Informa, I'm bringing you uh, Storm from Art on You Studios. He came to the office, we sat down, we had a beer, and we talked about his 2012 Inkathon. You're going to want to stick around for this. It's going to be a good one. Uh, we go on for about 30 some odd minutes. So, I mean, it's a great interview. Storm is always a really great person to talk to, so stick around and then support the cause. If you're in the valley, go get inked and support the cause, and you'll hear all about it shortly. Also, I have another article, Anti-Gay Voices Should Be Rebutted. Hmm. Gay Voices Rebutted. Let's see how I can play on this. And it's funny because, like, on one hand, I don't care if people are gay. Like, I, like vagina, and that's my thing, I can totally understand why people would like something else. Like, uh, on a human level, I get that. Not a big deal. And certainly, as far as this church of Satan goes, it, it means nothing. You know, it, it's your own personal preference, and that, as long as you're not hurting anyone, that's all that matters. But, I do have a problem with people shouting down others' opinions. Even if those opinions are racist, or racial, bigoted, uh, and hate speech. I have no problem with any of that. It's when it becomes more than speech that is at issue. And, well, I'll get into it shortly. And in Creature Feature, I'm going to talk about a show that I've loved for a long time, and I want to let you hear about it if you haven't already, and maybe t speak a little bit to it. Anthony Bourdain, No Reservations. This guy is amazing, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail there. And then, last week I didn't get to it, but this week I for sure am. Spaghetti versus Meat and noodles in this week's Bazaar of the Bazaar, a sort of bonus segment, if you will. <laughs> if you haven't gotten sick of my voice at an hour 20, stick around for this. Uh, and to be honest, this probably isn't going to be a very long show, so uh, let's, let's all sit tight and enjoy it as we can, eh? The Devil's Advocate starts now. Why bother? How you done? Great. Let's cut the bullshit and get real. Why this purity you feel about evil? For Christ's sake, why? It don't lie to me. I guess, Father. You gotta feel that old nick in your soul. And it becomes clear. Like it did for me. 
the first time. That's when I realized my one true calling in life. And what's that? Shit, man. <laughs> I'm a born devil's advocate. Welcome to the Devil's Advocate. I'm a Satanist. I'm a member of the Church of Satan. But I do not speak for the Church of Satan. That is all. Let's all open our Satanic Bible to page 81, Indulgence, Not Compulsion. And it opens with this. The highest plateau of human development is the awareness of the flesh. I love that that line it, it, and it speaks volumes to what satanism really is at its core and i, I had mentioned earlier indulgence is the the watchword of satanism and that, that's something that anton lavey speaks to in this article so what he's saying is uh indulgence and compulsion are completely different monsters so indulgence is something that you have the choice of doing you decide, well, I'm going to have a Merlot or I'm going to have, uh, uh, I don't know, a glass of milk, for example. It's a choice you have. And whatever it is, indulge in it. And not necessarily because, you know, we're Satanists and maybe you feel obligated to indulge all the time, so you're really Satanic, rah, and that's not what it is at all. It's <laughs> that if you want to do something, do it. As long as it's legal, there's no issue. When it does become an issue is when it becomes a compulsion. And you're no longer in control of it. This is something that I had to prove to myself and sort of shake loose when I was smoking. I truly, I mean, let's be honest here, I, I did it for practical reasons. My wife and I both smoked and she was getting really bad with uh, her coughing and sort of uh, general health. So I bit the bullet and, you know, sort of reimagined my personal image without smoking and then we stopped smoking. It was really that simple. It, but it was something that, you know, at, at the back of my head, I knew I was an addict. And that's what was horrible because it, it wasn't a choice. I, I made up all these sort of rules in the back of my head as to why it was okay and why it wasn't a compulsion because, well, I can stop at any time, which is this stupid cliche. Um, it doesn't control me. Uh, you know, it's just part of my personal identity and it's, you know, it's not something that I, I'm obligated to do. I just, I would like to have a smoke after I have sex or after a good meal or whatever. And it turns into, well, I need to step outside for five, 10 minutes to burn, a, uh, you know, have a smoke. Uh, and it would be like, I would, I would chain smoke two or three so that I would, I don't know, have enough nicotine before my next break at work. I mean, it, it got to a point where it was no longer me enjoying something. It was very much me uh, being chained, having the compulsion to smoke. And this isn't for everyone. I'm not saying everyone shouldn't smoke. That you know, Do what you want. It, it doesn't matter. It's legal, so whatever. For me, it became a compulsion issue, and I had to shake it loose at that point. And, you know, this could also be seen as a celebration of restriction. Because if it wasn't for all of the moral or just generic dogma restrictions that are placed on us um, from society and through religion and, and uh, your cultures you were raised in and uh, the family units you were uh, brought up in, if it wasn't for those restrictions, I think indulgence wouldn't necessarily even be applicable. I mean, if everything was okay to do at all times, if this was a purely hedonistic existence at all levels, maybe restrictions would be the indulgence, <laughs> you know? So I actually don't mind the idea of religious uh, dogma and restrictions because it's something that I get to sort of capitalize on through indulgence. It's sort of the fun of it for me. And, you know, that sort of first line that Anton LaVey wrote there, the awareness of the flesh. There's nothing wrong with understanding that you are a human being and you have needs and those needs need to be met. What's wrong is hiding that need or trying to deny it or trying to pretend like you are, I don't know, beating the human condition by denying yourself it and all the while just lying to yourself about who and what you are. 
And he speaks to it specifically in this, and it's not just to Christian faiths either. It's a, Eastern religions are, are really big into this. This idea of, of denying yourself because it's human and, and therefore elevating your consciousness and a bunch of mystical bullshit. The bottom line is, we're animals. Animals have needs. I, I distinctly remember my wife and I visiting my father's grave in um, Illinois and, uh, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't when it was Indiana. <laughs> they would be pissed if they heard that. So, uh, in Indiana, <laughs> I can't even talk. Uh, I met my father's girlfriend when he passed. And she said one of the earliest things that she imparted to uh, virtually every woman she's ever met uh, when it comes to discussing sex is that if you don't give your man what he needs, somebody else will. And it's not, it's not a threat, it's, it's a reality. And it doesn't just swing that one way. If you don't give your woman what she wants, she will get it somewhere else. So this is one of those things that you have to pay attention to, in, one, in any relationship for certain, but also just as a human being, is that it's not just... If you're going to take that leap and uh, commit yourself to another person or other persons, that's right, and you're not going to uh, give them what they require in as absurd or perverse way as you may see it, well then one, you're in the wrong place and you shouldn't be there to begin with, but two, they're going to go out and find it because human beings can only restrict themselves for so long. They can only pretend that their, their own perverse necessities aren't that important for so long. I'm very fortunate that my wife is is quite a uh, <laughs> I don't know what she she accommodates me. And uh I'm hoping all you out there as well. And and that's sort of the bottom line again. Responsibility. It has to be legal, it has to be consensual, but other than that, get your freak on because that is what we are. Indulge in the flesh. It is important. But remember that I personally think sex addiction is bullshit, but who knows, maybe it's not, and that's a compulsion. It is no longer about celebrating the flesh or celebrating the moment or the experience or the feeling. You now need it, and that's when it's not okay. So, indulgence is about choice. Compulsion is the lack of choice. It's an important distinction because they do not group, and we have to, as real rational adults, be able to see and respect that difference. Or else we're slaves to it. And, uh, no thank you. Let's move on to the Infernal Informant. Listen up! Listen up! Hey, y'all, daddy! Good news! And no devil! Bad news! Else, there's no heaven! There's nothing to see! I'm your Infernal Informant! Welcome to Infernal Informant. Today, I have friend of the show, Storm, from Art on You Studios. We're going to be talking about some very exciting news. Storm, thank you for joining me yet again. I appreciate it. I love being on here, man. It's awesome. It's and, and of course, with the home brew. Hells yes. you got to keep it going. Well, I had heard... Uh, I've actually been looking forward to this since last year. I, I got an amazing tattoo of a paw print for your last cause. So for this year, I was very excited when I heard you were going to be kicking up that Inkathon again. So I want to have you on. I want to talk about the Inkathon that you're uh, putting on. And get the information out there to the audience and see if there are ways that everyone can participate at some level. So let's do a little bit of background here first. What is it? Uh, well, maybe you can just define it. What is an Inkathon? Uh, the Inkathon was a project that we decided to do the first spring that uh, we were open. And it was something that we decided to do to sort of give back to all those that have given to us and supported us. And it was a way to give back to our community, but only toward those things that we felt we most wanted to support and get behind. Right. And so what we do is uh, we get together as artists and have some volunteers, and we have a series of sponsors that come on board with us, and we do a day's worth of tattoos. So while well, we have sponsors that will donate all the supplies and that sort of thing, we have... Uh, Awesome. Uh, people that will come in to, to volunteer and help us to lay stencils and to do paperwork and that sort of thing and kind of organize all the people. We, as the artists, will donate our skill and time for a day 
And every uh, last cent of the proceeds goes toward our charity of choice. That's that's amazing. So let's let's talk about a little bit of the past here. What are some of the previous, uh, I don't know, uh, projects, uh, causes that you've supported in the past? The first year, we decided to support the Huntsman Cancer Institute. All of us, in some fashion, know someone that uh, is either currently fighting or, unfortunately, has lost the fight yeah. to cancer. Uh, it affects one in four people in this country. And we decided, you know what, we want to do something to support that cause. And so we did little pink ribbons, primarily, but then we gave people the option of lavender ribbons, which, uh, which is for all types of cancer. And $20 for the little ribbons, they're little two-inch ribbons, and all proceeds did go to the research and development part of the Huntsman Cancer Institute, because we felt like research and development is probably the key. As much as we'd like to help those that are most in need, we thought, why not stop it before it even starts? Oh, yeah. So we decided to do it to research and development. And when we got to take the tour of the Institute, uh, the lady that tours around said, you know, we have a saying up here that you never know, this might be the $1 that supports the, the cure. You never know. And so, I mean, I, that really kind of jerked emotions at me when I was there and I saw the research department and how huge it is. Uh, you know, it's a vast area for all these people that are working pretty much around the clock on, on a cure and it, it was really neat. And we were able to raise, if I remember correctly, 34, I think it was $3,500 that we raised for, for the Huntsman with just three artists that first year. Jeez, that's amazing. Uh, and it actually also speaks... A lot to the community that's willing to support said cause. I mean, you, you, I mean, we're not just talking about dropping a 20 spot or a 50 spot on a piece of art. I mean, we're talking about supporting something. So someone who may have not even thought about getting a cancer ribbon uh, is going to go to your shop and, and you know willingly uh, have one put on themselves forever. Because they support that cause. So, I mean, yeah. that's amazing. And you, in fact, we it was so big to us that we had our youngest daughter uh, going around filming the line that went all oh, the way wow. out the door, clear down the block. And as you know, that there's uh, the pizza stop that's next to us, and then there's the filling station, which is a huge bar that goes all the way to the end of the block. Well, the line went across our shop in front of the pizza stop and all the way down <laughs> oh, in front man. of the filling station. <laughs> and all these people are waiting to come in. There are people that waited nearly 10 hours to get a pink ribbon to support Whoa. So... As, as, as harsh as it sounds to those yeah. people that, that are tattoo enthusiasts or maybe artists themselves, there are people that we were actually tattooing on sunburns, and they said, just do it. It's for the cause. I know I'm going to have to probably touch it up, and it's wow, probably going to heal like shit, but you know what? cool. I want to support this tattoo my sunburn, and it was, it was neat. It was really neat. Wow. And it went over so well that we decided, yeah, we are going to do this second year. So last year, we did it for the uh, Humane Society of Utah. Uh, not only as Satanists, but uh, just as people in general in the, in the whole shop, we all support animals and animal mm -hmm. causes. And we want to do something for all those puppies, kitties, and other animals out there. And we decided to do it for the Humane Society. That's, that's really cool. One thing that it, it seems so obvious to me that, I mean, people, they go out, you know, for a holiday or a birthday or something, and they go get a new puppy or, or a, a kitten they don't ever really take into account what it means to raise an animal, how close it is to actually raising another human being, arguable levels here, but the point is, is you're taking care of another life, and there's a bit of respect that needs to come into that, and, and a little bit of, of looking ahead. So there's so many animals that are just dropped off or abandoned or just... Uh, you know, thrown out of the family unit that they were brought into because there was no foresight. And, you know, Humane Society, uh, various city shelters, those organizations are built specifically just to take care of what everyone else discards. Right. I mean, seen in that light, it's not they're, not, they're not just animal lovers, though they are, but they're also literally taking what is shoved aside to die in order to keep going and provide to a family who actually is going to care for it. So, I mean, something like that, I, I was I was really moved by it. I came in and I helped you support it. And there was actually a lot of people who were there as well. Who were. Second season for the Sync-a-thon that you were putting on, um, they'd, they'd support you the first time. I talked to a lot of people in line. So, I mean, it wasn't just one of those things where, you know, you're in a line, like some weird factory industrial setup to get inked or anything. I mean, there's, there's a whole community based around your shop, which... For someone coming into 
a, a new event like this was very touching and very meaningful because it wasn't just some random shot supporting some random cause. Art on You Studios has an actual community based around it, which, I mean, th- there's the there's the financial aspect, which <laughs> me as a, a very realist can appreciate, uh, you know, on the business level. But there's also an, an emotional uh, level to it, which is, one, incredibly important for any business, but also for any cause that you're supporting. You know, you have the people in your court. I mean... Really, if it's not for the people, you're donating a, a, you know, what is meaningful to you. But that times the amount of people that come. Well, that's a huge deal. So this year, what are you, what are you tackling this year? First, I, I just want to touch a little bit further on what you're talking about, and uh, we are very proud of that community that does support us. I think it's really unique, and uh, it only further vindicates the the decision to go out there into the Magna area. Magna is yeah. a you know, kind of a smaller, tight-knit community, which reminds me an awful lot of Pocatello, Idaho, where I was raised, at least during a lot of my formable years, junior high, high school, and even in my college years. And that that's definitely, you know, there's a very similar vibe uh, that's out there in Magna that was much like what, what I was raised around. And I, I can't tell you how much that, that is appreciated when we have that uh, that foundation, that network of individuals that comes out to support us. And last year when we had some guest artists that came on board to help us, and we had some extra volunteers to help us, because, of course, literally the day of, the morning of, not two hours before we were ready to do the Inkathon, we were finishing the floor on the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. James is over there putting up spotlights because we didn't have lighting that was hooked up yet. Oh, that was wow. that was a proper. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember up on top of what's now the consultation booth. We had spotlights that were coming down into the respective areas, and we'd purchase some extra lights for each booth for the arts that we ha- were having coming on board to help us out at that time. And the floor had only been dry for a matter of hours. I mean, it was ready wow. to be mounted and worked on, but it was only a matter of hours that we finished that. To be presented, there weren't there were no shelves or anything in there yet. It was yeah, it was something else that we'd really pushed to have done, just in the nick of time for that for that event last year. And you're absolutely right, also about uh, the Humane Society. I know we don't have an ASPCA here in Utah, but we do have the Humane Society. And touching on you know animals. Uh, real quick, yeah, we treat them as familiars, and I know that you're aware of that. And familiars that uh, you know. Is, is a term that we certainly use, and I think it extends out to a lot of other people that, that treat their animals as a family member. And you saw those people that came out last year to support it, to get a paw print, yeah. either a dog or a, a cat paw print, and, and to give back to the Humane Society. And last year, we were able to raise $4,000 awesome. for, for the Humane Society. <laughs> so, awesome. I mean, it was, it was a really, really neat event. And this year, we decided, all right, year three, what are we going to do? You know, we supported cancer last year, or I mean, uh, two years ago, and last year we supported... The animals, what are we going to support this year that we can all genuinely get behind? We, that's that's another aspect. We don't want to just support Ronald McDonald House or any random charity <laughs> yeah, just to yeah. say, hey, we're supporting charity. Look at us. Look at me. We have a good guy badge. We're supporting a charity. No, if we're going to support something, we really want to you know, have some passion behind it because that's the only way that it's, it's going to turn out the way it has for the last two years. Yeah. So we'd seen some recent news reports uh, both online as well as on networks, on television, that were uh, informing us of money that's being taken away from the arts in the public school system. This, of course, is hitting pretty close to home for those of us that are artists. Yeah. You know, I've made a somewhat successful career out of, out of being an artist, and so has everyone else in our shop that, that has that title. So we don't want to see the next generation of artists uh, be put to the wayside because they don't have that nurture, they don't have that support system, and who knows who the next Jules Verne of the literary arts could be seeing in a classroom, or the next Andy Warhol, or the next whomever that could be seeing in a classroom somewhere. That they could be the next musician, the next great visual artist that's coming out of this country and out of the state of Utah. So we wanted to give back to the arts, and hopefully, it might be, it you know, ultimately a, a drop in the bucket when we're talking about millions of dollars that are really required for for these kids to have these programs. Uh, kept and intact instead of taken away from what is definitely waning. But you know what? Maybe it inspires others to say, I want to get on board with this too, and I also want to help to support the arts program. And that's what we decided to do. 
little side note, it's difficult as hell to find someone to take the money. Due to bu- <laughs> it, really? it, I, I kid you not. <laughs> but due to bureaucracy that is involved, I called on the state level and they said, I'm sorry, we can't take your money. Wow. And I said, what do you mean? You can't take my money. They said, well, it's a state program, so it's got to be state funded. Right, which means right. they can't take any sort of donations. You're going to need to talk on the, you know, talk to someone on the district level. So we start going on the district level. I'm talking to people like Brent Severe over at uh, Grant School District, who had said, "Oh, this sounds like a great deal. I love what you have to say. I think this is something that we can do. I'll bring it up to my next meeting." Weeks go by, and I, you know, I'm blowing up his phone, and I can't get any return phone call, no message. Wow. Finally, going back to the state level, and I say, "Listen." You know, I want to give money to you guys to, to help out. And they say, I'm sorry, you can't do it. I said, okay, well, let me see if I've got this straight. You have overcrowded classrooms. You have underpaid teachers, often underqualified teachers. Yeah. You don't have enough materials. You have talented individuals that need support and nurturing in these departments that are quickly waning, as I said, and will probably have them pulled. And you need money, you're crying out for money, but yet when someone wants to give you money, you can't take money. This is the ultimate catch-22. <laughs> so you know, what, what, what's going on here? And she says, welcome to our world. It's bureaucracy. You know, oh. there, there's, yeah, and I yes. just thought, unreal. This is unbelievable. <laughs> and I, I had no idea. Finally, I get a hold of someone in the, uh, in the Utah Arts Council, and actually it's the Utah Arts Museums, which is a division of the Utah Arts Council, who said, yes, we can take your money, and yes, it will go not only to public schools, but it will go to underprivileged kids in specifically art departments. Hell yeah. And she said, I will take it, and you know, I will definitely appropriate it toward art education for these youth, and anything that you can do would certainly help. And so we finally found somewhere that we can give back to these kids that would love to have have some development in the arts, and not only that, but she'd asked if I would come do a lecture this summer after uh, knowing what yeah. we do and after hearing about the lecture that I'd done recently at the uh, Magna Public Library. Yeah. And I'm going to talk to the kids about uh, tattooing, the history of tattooing, and careers in tattooing. Career, oh, careers very in the arts. cool. So, I mean, it, it, it ended up, you know, turning out to be a good deal, and even though it's last minute, sponsors are quickly coming back on board saying, we loved it last year, we're on board again this year. Oh, cool. Let's do it. Hell so. yeah. I got it. Arts, just in general, arts is, I mean, I'm a graphic designer, so obviously that's my, my life, is commercial arts. Sure. But it's a huge, huge part of what, at least in my world view, what it means to be a human being. We're not just worker bees we are creative destroying beings i guess yeah. you can say we love well, to create and we love to destroy and, and that's a huge part of what we're we expressive. are yeah we are expressive creatures if you want to go back as far as the case of lascaux in france i mean those are some of the earliest markings that yeah. we have in our history where we are expressing ourselves on on the walls of caverns that you know ancient people existed in and they, they would express themselves and what they were doing at the time they're hunting they're socializing and, you know, you can look at the Iceman, and he has the, the tribal marks on himself. We're not sure what those marks necessarily meant, but certainly he was expressing yeah. his life, perhaps his journey as a hunter, perhaps his journey as a warrior. We, you know, like I said, we're not sure, but he had over 50 tattoo marks on himself. He's expressing himself. Yeah, it means something. You know, and, that, and, that's, and that's an ancient folk art. You know, so it's, it's nearly a 10,000-year-old folk art. That's amazing. And, you know, no matter where it is, whether you're talking about uh, the Venus of Wellendorf, which are early sculptures that uh, you know that, that we can look at that, that are expressing ourselves that way. They're fertility mm-hmm. sculptures, or you know, like I said, the Case Lascaux, or all the way up to uh, modern surrealism. I mean, we are expressing ourselves through art, and it, it's it's a, something that we are adding to the culture. It may not always be a great addition to the you know to the to enrich the culture, but <laughs> certainly, so, yeah. you know, certainly there is a lot of art out there that we can say even with, in our within our own organization that is definitely contributing to enriching. You know our lives, yeah. and so that's why it's so important, and why I get so passionate about the about the arts. Not always in my career, but it's uh, you know, <laughs> something that, that that I get behind and say, yes, I want to support all the artists that are out there and all their various mediums that's and what great. they're doing to enrich the cultures around the world. I mean, that that really touches on the next question that I had is the the creative rationale, um, it, and it's pretty obvious as a tattoo shop that you're going to want to support at some level the arts. But, I mean, like you said, that there's such a bureaucracy behind the arts uh, movement, behind support of the arts in our state, 
Um, and, and it can't just be our state. So, I mean, there has to be similar situations in, in every other state in the union here. But uh, the fact that there's such bureaucracy, but you're still willing to go to the lengths necessary to support said expression. Uh, I mean, and that's huge because it, it's easy to say, well, okay, you're not going to accept it. I'm going to move on to something else that may have more or less meaning. But the fact that you're, you're, you're sticking with it, you delve into it, you're looking for someone who is willing to not only accept your money, because at some level that has to be a little bit easier than anything else, but is actually going to do something meaningful with yes. your money. Um, and maybe it's just my own experience with, with having grown up in a, a, a difficult financial uh, background, but those with nothing to lose have in my opinion, a greater means of expressing themselves. And maybe not just means, but a, 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 a more powerful message. Uh, it just connects clearer, in my opinion, than someone of means who, who, who doesn't have to struggle for that message to come through that's just given everything. So I, I think that is an amazing way to have this year's Inkathon uh, be spread through. Let's talk about... Because this is a tattoo shop after all. What are the tattoos um, that you're doing for this? We're going to be doing a series of silhouettes. And in fact, uh, between today and tomorrow, I'm going to be finishing those silhouettes. And I'm going to get them posted cool. uh, on our websites, uh, the home site, as well as our Facebook page. They're going to be a series of silhouettes. They're going to cover the visual arts, uh, literary arts, performing arts, and music, as well as dance. Wow. So we've, we've got little silhouettes. They're going to be... Simplified two inch by two inch pieces. They're not going to be really complex. Some have been asking about the silhouettes around the poster. Yeah. Those are pretty complex silhouettes, and, and to try and execute something like that on nearly a hundred individuals walking through the door on that day <laughs> yeah. would would be a task difficult to say the least. So we're going to have some simplified ones. We're going to do the co classic comedy and tragedy faces, which oh, we quickly cool. line out. Yeah. Um, Hopefully, there are no listeners on here that will call them "Smile Now, Cry Later." I think that's a real fast. <laughs> I've never heard of that. You know, you know, yeah, I mean, it's it's something they come in all the time, you know, and, you, and you'll hear these individuals that will say, "Oh yeah, you have the smile now, cry later faces," you know. And <laughs> so it, it it's more of a would be a polite way to put it, an urban term that that has been yeah. applied to these faces, and they've taken you know little little, little twist on on what is actually comedy and tragedy. So we're going to do the comedy and tragedy masks. Uh, we're going to just have a simple music note, a little eighth note for, for music. Uh, for literary, we are going to do an open book, and we'll, we'll quickly uh, shade in what, you know, the uh, reference of pages and probably some scribbling cool. on there for the writing. And for dance, we've got a pair of ballet slippers. And for uh, visual arts, we're going to have a paint palette. And the negative space will be the paint splotches and nice. where, the, where the thumb would come through on the... On the paint palette, so yeah. I've, I've just got a little bit left to, to kind of get those together and quickly get them out, so people know what their choices are. And what's nice is each year we've been giving more choices. The first year is yeah. just it was just the one ribbon with the choice of two colors. The second year you had two poppers to choose from. Yeah. And this year I believe we're going to have uh, five silhouettes. Wow. So yeah, we're, we're definitely expanding. <laughs> That's awesome. That's cool. I'm definitely going to be getting a little paint palette. <laughs> yeah. Pretty fucking sure, absolutely. And, you know, we, we couldn't include every single discipline within the art, so we had to kind of put right. them all together. Yes, I know sculpture is a visual art, but we couldn't have all these ones. So we're kind of placing visual arts, be it sculpture, be it metal shop and jewelry, be it, uh, you know, uh, I know that there's also weaving and that yeah. sort of thing that's out there. We're, we're kind of placing that all within visual arts. So it's not just paint and drawing that's going to be represented by the paint palette. It's all visual arts that will be in there. Yeah, uh, and that makes sense. I mean, I, I don't think anyone would expect, because literally you could just run out of ideas, you know, have a hundred easy ideas for the different creative expressions that yeah. you're under. So, yeah, you could. I mean, you have to limit it somehow. Um, I think that, those are great ways. So what about what about price? So I remember last year it was, uh, okay, I say I remember. I believe it was $20 a pop. That's rate. correct. Yep. Are we doing that again? Yes. It'll still be $20. So something pretty affordable. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 diffi yeah, it's difficult to, to find individuals at least 18 and over, which it is limited to 18 and over. Yeah. They, they can't come up with a quick $20, especially with this much notice. Typically, people can come up with an Andrew Jackson to, to donate toward the <laughs> yeah. art. So that's what's going to be again this year. And like I said, every last penny is going to be going toward... Uh, the the arts, awesome. uh, the the Utah Arts Council. Yeah, 
I, I I absolutely love the idea of it. I mean, the price. I mean, that's that's nothing. If literally, if you're gonna go get a, a coffee at any coffee shop once a day for a week, that's more than you're gonna be spending on a twenty buck tattoo. And it's uh, immortalized in ink. You know, your support for a cause. So that's negligible. You know, I mean, realistically. So I know last year you had a bunch of helpers. Do you have uh, Do you have people supporting the shop this year? I mean, you even had people that were in line, just friends of yours uh, that that wanted to support you, that came in and, and aided. Do you still have, do you have that? Oh yeah, you that, bet. That, in, in fact, there are people that have been asking, really since since we closed the event last year, they were already That's asking, great. "What are you going to support next year? You know, how can I help? How can I volunteer <laughs> next year?" Which is pretty cool. But when we're yeah. done, I pretty much feel like, "Oh my gosh, I just cleaned this up." Do you know what I want to think about now? <laughs> A whole line of just regular routine again, yeah. you know. So, so when people are asking, "What are you gonna support next year?" I, I'm always saying, I, "I have no idea." You know, ask ask me at the beginning of the new year what we're looking at right now. I'm, by by the time I do the Inkathon, pretty much my focus immediately goes over to Halloween. Not not that it really ever stopped, but um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, that, that's pretty much where my focus goes directly from Inkathon to maybe the. Uh, I, I don't know what we're going to call it this year, but the Halloween in July event, and then probably Halloween Ooh. after that. But, uh, you know, we, we do. We have a large group of people that I call loyals, uh, people that are among our minions, uh, that, that all have the AOI tattoos on them. They're definitely all, all geared up to, to <laughs> do it again this year and to help in any way they can, whether that's uh, organizing with people outside and essentially entertaining and amusing them. There are people that go up and down the line and just say, hey, are you good? Do you need a drink or anything? And uh, people inside, there will be people that are going to help to lay stencils, and that includes shaving them, laying the stencil on them, getting their paperwork done, keeping wow. them organized all the way up wow. to lead them into respective booths when the, you know, when the next artist is open. Yeah. So when they come back into our space, we already know if we're working on a leg, an arm, or whatever, and we don't have to really do anything except set up our machine and begin inking. That's what I'm talking about when, it, when I mentioned earlier about community. I've, I'm a collector of, of, of tattoos, and I've gone to a lot of shops. And I've never, not fucking once, seen a community like you've built and that people are willing to be a part of. I mean, this is amazing. And more to the point... Magna, if you're talking about the Salt Lake area, is not the closest, but people are willing to go there. They're willing to go the the extra 5, 10, 20 minutes, depending on their location, in order to get inked by you. And yes, it is obviously because you're good at what you do. You have an amazing staff that, you know, you're all amazing artists. But I feel like I, there's a little bit more than that because you're not just... You're not just artists. You're artists who are involved. And that speaks volumes, especially when it comes to having something permanently on your skin. Supporting causes like this is just proof of it. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. And and really, that goes back to uh, the new motto that we have, which is experience tattoo magic. Yeah. And initially, I, I want to do something because I know that we have the sort of year-round Halloween theme. Yeah. Renee and I are magicians. <laughs> well, you know, in parentheses there. But, you know, I, and it, it just kind of spilled out of me, and I put tattoo magic. And then it yeah. later went to experience tattoo magic, which is now on the wristbands that we're handing out. It's on all the flyers. It, you know, it's going to be on future T-shirts. And, I, I, and the reason that that came about was because I felt like when people came in, they really do have an experience. Yeah. And I would never claim to be the best artist in this valley alone, let alone outside of it. I can list quickly a number of artists I think they're unbelievably talented, highly skilled uh, individuals in this valley. But I think that what we offer that maybe they do not is the experience. When they come into that shop, there's definitely something. There's an aura yeah. that surrounds them from, from the popcorn that's being handed to them to seeing that chair to being tattooed by Julie or Adam or whoever's in there and when they leave they they feel like wow I, I really got more than a tattoo I had an experience and I think that that's what truly rings uh, true with everyone when, when they look at it and they say yeah I, I did I experienced tattoo magic and, and, we're, and, we're, and we're very proud of that that, yeah, we, that we created that I mean just my wife's friend who's actually in the back room keeping the kids quiet right now uh she uh, had gone to uh, your shop and was uh, talking about the experience and how much she loved it, how much the artists were amazing, and how you were uh, personally involved, just talking to her about it. 
uh, had no idea I knew you at all. <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, it was just, you know, word of mouth that she was spreading, and I know I'm not the only one she's talking to. So that is, as far as a business aspect, amazing. But just that human level of it that the arts really touches on, that, you know, you're, you're specifically uh, working the cause for, that's so fucking essential. It's, it's amazing. Well, thank you. So naturally, you want to beat out last year's, just like you did the year before. I wonder if you ever have a fear that that you're not going to be able to do that. I mean, do you do you ever even take that into consideration? Or are you just focused on the event that you're putting on in order to help the arts? Yeah, it, it, yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head there. But it's not so much how much can I raise, yeah. it, you know, financially speaking, but how much awareness can I raise? And I think that's what's most important to me and why I spend as much time as I do uh, calling the various media outlets, printed, uh, online, or uh, television networks, that sort of thing. That's the reason I spend as much time as I do. So I'm trying to create awareness for the particular cause that we're supporting, whether it was cancer, whether it's for the animals, or this year for the arts. That's what I'm trying to do, is, is I'm really trying to raise awareness and to get people talking about it and saying, you know what? We have a we, we have some out there, you know, an issue that needs to be addressed. We have cancers affecting 25 percent of the population. We have pets that are homeless, that are abused, that uh, you know that have not been spayed, and neutered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have kids that are talented beyond belief, but unfortunately, they have no way to to ever have that nurtured. So they're going to be forced to go into some other trade or career. Not that that's necessarily bad, but who knows what, what, what they might have been mm-hmm. had they been nurtured. They might have been the next Hemingway. So yeah. that's that's kind of what I think about when, when I'm doing these things. It's not so much how much money can I raise, but how much awareness can I raise for the particular cool. cause. Oh, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit of logistics here. When is this event held? It's going to be Saturday, May 12th. It is going to go from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, just like last year, I'll probably come out and give a little... You know, announcement to sort of, uh, I guess, open the event, if you will, and then we're going to go at it, and we'll have everyone lined up, ready to rock and roll, and and keep it going all the way until eight o'clock. Wow, that's amazing! That's a full day's work. <laughs> it, it is. It's like two full days of work. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a little rough, and I, I, and this year I I was had the foresight that I did the past two years, not one, but you know, I, yeah, so after the first year. And, lo- and, and not to get too far on the tangent, but the first year, it was so overwhelming, we had to go into the second day and kind of make that up with, well, some, with yeah. some additional people on the second day. So the next year, what do I do? I said, no, no matter what, we're only doing the one day, but we'll be open on Sunday. <laughs> Which, looking back on that last year as I went in there, and I, it, it was worse than, than any hangover I've had to endure. I just thought, I, why am I here, man? I'm, I'm already kicked my own ass. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to go in for more punishment. This year, I said, guys, we're not... We're, if we're going to do anything, it's to come in for an hour or two to, to do some additional cleanup and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. We are not going to be open on Sunday the 13th. No <laughs> way, man. I'm going to go home and take a nap. <laughs> Maybe stop by your house for some home brew first. Yeah, yeah. Best, you know, but... <laughs> we'll definitely be here uh, to support you. <laughs> if you need your whole crew, if you want. I'll, I'll, I'll deliver. <laughs> yeah, I'll hold you to that one, man. <laughs> for sure. Uh, okay, so let's talk about supporting. Where what is the address? Uh, where can people go here? I, I know this is Utah, and this is localized, and this is a podcast. So at, I literally have people in Ghana that listen. So um, let's that say you're shit. going. To, yeah. yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> For the one listener in Ghana, hi, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's say they're going to be in the Valley in May. So you said there's going to be the, the 12th of May, the 12th of May, and it is at uh, our shop, which is 8971 West, 2700 South, which is now it's uh, Magna Maine. In Old Town Magna, wow. we are right in between the Kiwi Bakery and Pizza Stop slash Filling Station. Oh yeah, get inked and get some good pizza. Yeah, get some pizza. Get or the bakery for that matter. They have the oh, they have homemade pastries. fish and chips. All their pastries are made from scratch daily. And then of course afterwards, you can go down to the filling station and get an ice cold beer. Which by the, the way, they event. were ranked among the coldest beers in Utah. Wow. Yeah. How do you even the get the <laughs> they, they have they have a team that actually if you if, in City Weekly the our independent magazine they went out and they uh, did temperatures and I can't remember if they did they were in like the top three if not first wow. place yeah the filling station huh. coldest beer in Utah yeah, well let's not detract it from, I, I know I, so I'm a beer like so hey, beer, <laughs> beer and tattoos yeah. so let's focus go get some pastry to start your day 
get a little bit of energy for your tattoo. Get your tattoo, go get some lunch with the pizza, and then end at the filling station. Yeah. You have a whole day in Magna. Or you can combine it together. The filling station is, is owned by the same people that own the, the pizza stuff, so you can eat oh, cool. your pizza in the filling station. You can have uh, cold beer and pizza. Nothing better than that. Oh, right. Oh, my goodness. All right, so let's talk about those people that are out of state. Uh, for the listener in, in Ghana, Mike calling you out, man. Uh, let's say, <laughs> is is there a PayPal address? If they just want to support by donating money. Sure, they absolutely. They, they could do it. Uh, the PayPal is linked up to my email, which is uh, the underscore artist underscore storm at yahoo.com. And that, you know, if they, if they want to donate, just make sure that they note on there that it is going to be a contribution toward the event. And I'll be sure and not only uh, appropriate that money where it needs to be, but I'll, I'll announce it online. Say thank you very much to the following people that donated through PayPal. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to be putting that in the show notes, and I'll probably be pimping it out just on my various social networking site pages as well. Because I don't think that... Just getting a tattoo is the reason people do stuff like this. Uh, I, I think the the cause is enough, and I, I think that there are enough people online that we can maybe uh, you know do our part. Uh, I say our, I don't mean our because I'm going to get inked. But <laughs> for those of right. you who aren't right. in state, donate anyway because uh, it is something meaningful. And I know everyone is connected to the arts because we're human beings. It is a natural expression. Uh, so do what you can for an amazing well, shop. And, and here's something to, to, to consider when you're thinking about the arts. And in this case, I'll, I'll use the literary arts as an example. Uh, I'm not going to downplay math and science by any stretch of the imagination. Bill, I'm going to be proud to hear that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, you know, I can't downplay math and science. It's equally as important. However, let's look at all those scientists out there that want to reach to the depths of the ocean, that want to reach to the stars and walk on the moon. And who is probably their greatest inspiration? Jules Verne. Yeah. And there are still people yeah. to this day that are looking at Jules Verne's writing and are inspiring him. I recently saw uh, an episode on the Science Channel where they were talking about Jules Verne. And uh, there's an individual scientist out there that's creating a cannon that will shoot uh, a payload up into, up into space for fuel. That once the space shell goes up there, they will have fuel payload waiting for them, and they uh-huh. can, from there, shoot to the next destination because the greatest amount of fuel is used just getting up out of the atmosphere. Yeah, sure. The gun that they're going to be using to shoot that fuel up into space was inspired by the reign of Jules Verne. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there are these people that have these, you know, great imaginations, these foresights of the future, the Isaac Asimovs, the Ray Bradburys, and the Jules Vernes that are out there that are inspiring scientists because they may not be able to think creatively that far, but they can like say, you know what? I I think I could build something like this. I could good. build a wall TV like what I read in uh, Fahrenheit 451. I could build a TV that is just the size of a wall, but had I not read that, I might not have even considered a wall TV. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's important that we have those creative people out there to inspire the scientists to the next great invention. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I got to say, th- this is certainly one of those uh, events that... I mean, as Satanists, we're not really concerned with helping people for helping people. We're doing this because it's meaningful. There, there, yes. There's some, there's some element that connects with Art on You Studios and with Storm. Uh, do what you can to support them. No one's asking for your inheritance or your monthly paycheck. But what you can, if you can drop a 10, if you can drop a 20, if you can drop a 50, well, it actually matters, and it certainly matters to us. And, uh, you know, if you're in town and you can get a, a little piece to remember it by in the process, more power to you. Art on You Studios, Inkathon, May 12th. Support a fantastic shop and a fantastic cause. Storm, thank you so much for you joining bet. me. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. All right, let's dive into the article here. Anti-gay voices should be rebutted. This is the uh, Washington Post posted today. 22nd by Jennifer Rubin. A leading anti-gay figure in the Republican Party attacked Governor Mitt Romney for hiring an openly gay spokesman, sending a shot from the GOP's socially conservative base across the nominee's bow. Brian Fisher, the director of issue analysis for the Tupelo, Mississippi-based American Family Association, is probably the most straightforwardly anti-gay Republican to appear regularly in the party's mainstream. Presidential candidates, include Rick Santorum, have appeared on his radio show, and he spoke at the Values Voter Summit in Washington in October. 
He responded yesterday to Romney's decision to hire an openly gay, out and loud gay, end quote, in Fisher's terms, foreign policy spokesman Richard Grinnell by calling it a message to the pro-family community of drop dead. <laughs> Is that because their seed doesn't get fertilized? <laughs> like, and they drop dead? I know what he's saying. At the Values Voter Summit, Smith recalls Romney's oblique reference Fisher and his ilk, our values ennoble the citizen and strengthen the nation. We should remember that decency and civility are values, too. One of the speakers who will follow me today has crossed that line, I think. Poisonous language doesn't advance our cause. It's never softened a single heart nor changed a single mind. Both left- and right-leaning gay organizations defended Romney and Grinnell. Fisher's ugly outburst was quickly followed by a slimy report by Romney antagonist Matt Lewis in the Daily Caller, asserting that New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, appointed of a gay state Supreme Court Justice Bruce Harris, has a blotch on his record and a problem for his vice presidential prospects. With Mitt Romney under fire for hiring an openly gay spokesman, a growing chorus of conservatives are also voicing concern over his possible running mate's appointment of an openly gay Republican in the New Jersey Supreme Court. The piece that goes on to cite conservatives who criticize his judicial philosophy, not his sexual orientation. So who has a problem with an openly gay justice? Conservatives or Lewis? There plainly is debate generationally, as I have reported within the GOP on gay marriage. But while this goes on, there should, one would hope, be a consensus that animus towards gays and toward hiring gays to work in government or anywhere else is beyond the pale. Polls like Rick Santorum and socially conservative groups who don't want to endorse Fisher's brand of hate shouldn't associate themselves with him. In a January primary debate, Romney said this on gay rights, as the Los Angeles Times reported. Mitt Romney was reminded Sunday morning on the NBC Facebook debate stage of a pledge he made in 1984 that he would be a voice in the Republican Party to foster anti-discrimination efforts in the gay community. Asked how he fulfilled that pledge, Romney said that as governor of Massachusetts, he has a gay cabinet member and appointed judges regardless of their sexual orientation. From the very beginning in 1994, I said to the gay community, I do not favor same-sex marriage. Romney said, I oppose same-sex marriage, but if people are looking for someone who will discriminate against gays or will in any way try to suggest that people that have different sexual orientations don't have full rights in this country, they won't find that in me. That is actually President Obama's present position as well. Romney's remarks should serve as a guide for conservatives. It would be a positive thing for the party and our country if it was crystal clear that there was no place in civil discourse for these fanning the flames of hatred towards gays and egging on fellow conservatives to discriminate against gays in hiring. Unfortunately, not everyone on the right agrees. That's the end of the article. And I gotta tell you, I agree with the, the premise that's presented. And that is that you should not discriminate on someone's sexual orientation, regardless of politics, for a position that they would be potentially um, appointed to. And what we have to realize is that there is human capacity that we're talking about. And that is what is important. If they are capable of performing the job in a stellar manner, hire them. Who cares if they like men, women, two guys, and one girl? Uh, three guys and no girls, or if it's all just, I don't know, a, a doll. Who cares? Because what they do in that bedroom, as long as they're indulging and not, you know, being compulsive, is not going to affect their performance in any, any position uh, regardless. And it doesn't stop them from being capable. Now, what I do have a problem with here is that they're saying that there should be no place in civil discourse for language like this but all that's doing is pretending like we don't exist as human beings individual independent thinking creatures we are ingrained with bigotry that is informed from our cultural background uh the family unit that had raised us and the era in which we were born because let's be honest there is a time when racism for example 
was absolutely encouraged and it was okay. There was a time when women were not allowed to vote and it wasn't that long ago. So women weren't full-fledged citizens. We, we like to pretend, we wear these glasses as if the way we're thinking right now has always been and has always will be uh, the way that the world is not only taught throughout history, but how it has been throughout history. And that's not the case at all. We live in a very, very liberal time in the world, and it's, it feels like as, as open as we are as a culture, as a world culture, there's obviously religion pulling us back, but there's also the idea that we are not allowed to speak to those feelings that are still dormant within us. If you don't feel comfortable sitting on a train next to an openly gay man, you have something, like in my mind, you have a problem somewhere in within you like like that is a dormant issue but there's nothing wrong with it because that would be like saying that your natural way of being is wrong and it's not just like i'm <laughs> i'm very sure that there are black people who have a problem sitting in a let's say a bus for example with a bunch of people with white hoods that would be a horrible place for them to be and it is informed through their cultural history. That is where that bigotry comes from. But it's still there. And voicing that, well, that actually would probably be okay in our culture. But if it were the opposite, you know, one guy with a white hood who survived a bus ride with, with a, a bus full of black people, then uh, he would be shot down. Um, maybe, literally, <laughs> but also verbally for it. I mean, just the, the comedian uh, uh, Kramer, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his state, his actual name, it's just his character's name, uh, when he uh, used the N-word, nigger, when he talked to someone in his audience, he was shot down by everyone, and he's a comedian who was responding to a heckler. It, it just gets to the point where we have to, at some point, say... I don't care what you said, because words don't actually do anything to me. It's when you start burning crosses on the lawn that I got a problem. And hey, you know what? Let's use that as justification to get rid of crosses altogether. But to the point, there's no there's no issue. Now, I'm coming from a position of never having experienced um, being a, a suppressed or oppressed uh, homosexual or homosexual voice. It's, it's just something that's not in my personal realm of experience. However, that doesn't mean that I cannot sympathize and understand. So I do get that there are places where there is very real physical harm that comes to people because of their religious... I mean, I'm a Satanist. Of course I understand this. Uh, because of their religious backgrounds, because of their sexual backgrounds, because of their ethnicity. Yeah, there are real consequences for that. And that's the world we live in. We got to stop pretending like we can change it just by censoring everyone or telling older Republican bigots that they are not allowed to speak because on the off chance that they do say something, it's going to be offensive to somebody else. Their constituents know that they are that bigoted and I will go on a limb and say that they are just as bigoted. <laughs> Their constituents. So if he's speaking to what the people who put him in office see as a truth, then what is the problem? I mean, this is what is so, why it's so great, in my opinion, that, uh, you know, you can live in a place like America where it is okay to say things like this, or it was, I thought, until now. <laughs> Look, if I want to say that I disagree for someone, and the only reason why I disagree with them is because of their sexuality, and I want to be that shallow and empty, well, then I should have that right to do it. Whether you agree with it or not, especially if you don't agree with it, then you should welcome it. Because one, it may inform people how ignorant I am, and two, go to further your point and cause more than trying to shut them down. Because all that makes it look like is you're weak, and you are incapable of dealing with other human beings, which in the political arena is your fucking job. So... Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, stop there with a very powerful ending. Let's take a short break and dive on into, uh, oh, geez, this is already the creature feature.
Prepare for incoming message. Prepare yourself for Deep Six Radio. I am Matt, host of Deep Six Radio. And I am in Riss. Yes, we are. So if you want to be one of the six taking on the oh-so-lovely Idris and want to be featured on the show... Send your emails and MP3s to us at deep6 at radiofreesatan.com Include a bio and anything you want mentioning on air. We are open to any genre apart from rap. Deep Six also includes a fine selection of alternative rock as well as multiple other genres. So why not jump on the roller coaster? That is Deep Six Radio. Deep Six is available on radiofreesatan.com and also iTunes a week later. We, we look, look forward, forward to, to you joining, joining us. us. End of the line. Oh God! No. Just me. <laughs> Did you know that after the heart stops beating, the brain can function? For well over seven minutes, we got six more minutes to play. <coughs> Why are you screaming when I haven't even cut you yet? Welcome to Creature Feature. Anthony Bourdain, no reservation. Or as they do on the show, no reservation. All right, I'm going to give you a little about the show, okay? So this is on the Travel Channel. It's usually on on Mondays. Anthony Bourdain has a, a couple other shows sort of running simultaneously, so this one is sort of, you know, cut and dry. Uh, it, it's not always regularly on Mondays. But when it is, it's amazing. Okay, so this is the about the show from their website. Besides the chef's hat... Anthony Bourdain wears many others. TV personality, best-selling author, public speaker, weary world traveler, gourmand, uh, punk rock aficionado, proud New Yorker, and most recently, doting father. He's even kicked his lifelong smoking habit. That's right, Anthony Bourdain is no longer a chain smoker. However, the fans that know him best can rest assured that the infamously grumpy, sharp-tongued host of No Reservations has become anything but pedestrian. As he continues to explore every corner of the globe in his Emmy Award-winning Travel Channel series, Anthony Bourdain encounters the weird, wild, and downright outrageous personalities and places that help define the international cultural landscape. Whether it's eating the raw eyeball off a bloody seal carcass on a kitchen floor, flying through the treetops of Vancouver on a zip line, or hunting for lizards in the desert of Saudi Arabia, Bourdain refuses to yield to middle age or tar-stained lungs when adventure comes calling. However, it's the foreign food that best captures our host's attention. In the world of a cook, an understanding and appreciation of how others eat is akin to discovering secret societies and cryptic subcultures. Cooks have a special access. As always, the food is only the first glimpse of a wider view of how people live their lives in faraway lands and unfamiliar territories. In the fog-shrouded highlands of Papua New Guinea, the last vestiges of a World War II cargo cult, or the jarring light shown that is Las Vegas at night, no reservation dives head first into life's cult- colorful and rich pageantry. Join Anthony Bourdain as he circumnavigates the globe on his conquest to discover the cities, villages, and countries that provide life's truest surprises. And that's sort of, uh, you know, it, it, it's like the uh, introduction here. Let, let, let me give you mine. Because I don't, I don't watch this show because it's a travel channel show. I don't watch it because I like him as a host. I like it because I identify with him as a host. And he shows you his flaws as a human being. And this pretty much goes for any series on TV or, you know, the history of TV or radio. When the host allows you a glimpse into who they are while they're delivering entertainment, that is a sign of something special. I've modeled that notion off of what I do here on my show. You have to show your own flaws 
your own passions, your own experiences, while doing something that is really just sort of banal, and that's giving opinion. When you can touch the host through their uh, provided persona, well, that's something special, and that's what Anthony Bourdain does, and that's why I love it so much, and <laughs> he's awoken in me uh, years ago when I first started uh, watching his amazing series, a passion for the pig. <laughs> of all the animals in the world, I think the pig is the most amazing to consume, and he has helped me get there. So, uh, you know what, for that alone, it's definitely worth, it, worth, worth a watch. This series... I'm sorry, this uh, season so far is actually pretty good. There's only two episodes in it, but uh, it is out. The CDs of past seasons are available, so if you want, pick it up, rent it, get it on Netflix. Anthony Bourdain, no reservations. He's an author, he's a writer, and he has a unique perspective. Something that is very, very amazing when you're talking about a travel channel show. Because he's not just showing you, like I said before, the culture or the food. I mean, he's giving you, a, and, and each show is sort of wrapped around a, a new framework. So there's always, you know, something new to see. It's not the same, it's not to put together the same way. It's not expected. Uh, so, you know, he gives you his own colorful wit, not only as a live host, but as the uh, uh, the voice throughout the entire show, um, you know, running over the actual show, it's really great. You will never be disappointed by watching this. Anthony Bourdain, no reservations. Uh, check it out. And that's going to do it for this creature feature. Let's dive right into uh, Bizarre Bizarre and wrap this bad boy up. It is actually running a little bit longer than I expected. So see you there. <laughs> Bizarre. Bizarre. It's the bizarre of the bizarre. All right, this bizarre of the bizarre. Uh, it's spaghetti versus meat and noodles. And let me give you a little bit of background. I've been married for over a decade. I know, surprising. I look so young on radio, right? <laughs> but it is throughout that entire time of me being married that I've had this continual fight with what is spaghetti. And you would think that after 13 years that someone would be able to read your mind and understand, and you don't even have to read mine because I've shouted it at the top of my lungs throughout our history together, of what spaghetti is to me. And when you make it for me to make it to said specifications. Now, this is going to sound anal, but l listen up here. I like spaghetti. Spaghetti is the noodle, if you don't know. It is not the meat. It is not the sauce. It is the noodle. And I like to use that as the primer of the plate of spaghetti. The sauce colors said noodle. It adds spice. It adds flavor. It adds body. And the meat, if you're going to go down that road, which is, you know, cut and dry with me, well, that's fine, but... It's not to overdo the dish. So you can literally take two pounds of meat and put it on top of a plate of spaghetti and some people will be happy as shit and I will be very angry because that is not spaghetti. That is cow with a noodle. And it is not the same thing at all. That is meat and noodles and not spaghetti. So I tell my wife every time, uh, please do not mix meat in with the sauce. Do not put it all together. On I will. It got to the point where I was. I will dish it myself before you do anything crazy with it, so I can get my noodles and I can get a little bit of gravy on top. You know the sauce, and I can just enjoy spaghetti for what it is—the noodle. But maybe out of spite, maybe just to keep it interesting, maybe to torture me, she adds like a pound and a half of meat with <laughs> this. And it's just like torture, where I'm literally eating like a sloppy joe with noodles, and it's no longer spaghetti. She knows I hate it, but she keeps doing it. And it's just like digging the fork into my ass. Arr. Okay, so uh, that was kind of a weird analogy. Like, fork in the ass. Um, okay, she... We got to a point where I said, okay, look, look, look. If you want that much meat, fine. Make meatball. Make a meatball, and and we can portion out the meat 
<laughs> as we want. And if you want it to simmer in the uh, spaghetti sauce, well, that is fine. But have it in a ball form so it's not completely overtaking the entire meal. And I'm not eating cow rather than spaghetti like I want to be eating. And I, it, it happened once. And it was like, I, I know at some point she just tortured me. Because she did it right like like once and then I complimented her on it and made such a big deal out of it she did it again and then the next time she made it again and it was back to regular back to square one meat and noodles and she's just like why is this happening to me like what did I do to piss you off so bad that maybe it's doing this podcast and taking attention away from her <laughs> whatever it is I'm tired of meat and noodles like why even bother eating if you're not going to enjoy the presentation and you're not going to enjoy the flavors of what you're eating. Because I gotta tell you, meat has a flavor and it's not that great on its own. Don't get me wrong, I like a good seasoned steak, but there's seasoning in it. Yeah. Just plain hamburger sitting on its own is not that great. And you put a ton of it in sauce and all it is is sloppy joes. And you know who likes sloppy joes? 12 year old kids, not grown ass men who've been married for 13 years having the same argument over meat and noodles just wanted spaghetti his whole life. <sighs> oh my God. Okay. It's <laughs> been a long day. It's hot in this room. Maybe I should uh, take it down a notch. Okay, so that's the battle I have had my entire married life. Spaghetti versus meat and noodles. And that's going to do it for yet another show. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love to hear from you. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. You can visit the SatanNet, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, or MySpace page for 9 cents and get updated on weekly topics. Listen to the show at RadioFreeSatan.com or download the show Monday nights via my RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. You can also subscribe via iTunes by searching 9 cents. And don't forget to leave a rating and or comment if you do. If you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit churchofsatan.com. And if you'd like to hear other fine satanic voices, music, or personalities, visit RadioFreeSatan.com, an online streaming radio station. Once again, thank you for joining me. And as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell. And until next week, Hail Satan! There's a little headphone. <laughs>